this is it. This is really it. If you've read Matthew chapter 24, if you read First and Second Timothy, you know that in the last days, difficult times, perilous times will come. And in both chapters, in both books, there are descriptions of the last day. There are descriptions of what's happening right here on planet Earth. Specifically, where you live, in this region, in this community. Difficult days. On one hand, we are seeing a lot of growth in our community, economic growth. I read just this morning that the growth in Chattanooga now is outpacing all the other cities in Tennessee. In 2007, when the announcement came that Volkswagen was coming to Chattanooga, the front page of the Chattanooga Times Free Press said, Favor Nuga. Turn to somebody and say, You have favor. So this is it. Last days, intensity. There is a spiritual war, spiritual battle going on for your soul for your life, for your family, for your kids, for your business, for everything that's precious to you. John 10, the Bible says, the thief comes to steal, kill, and to destroy. But Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and you might have it more abundant. So if this is really true, if the Bible is really true, in the last days difficult times perilous times will come where men will be lovers of themselves breaking covenant living lives that are boastful proud blasphemous disobedient to parents you seen that one lately unthankful unholy truce breakers covenant breakers heady high minded Lovers of self more than lovers of God. Have you seen that? He said, from such turn away. Matthew 24, when the disciples said to Jesus, how will we know the last days, the end times? And he gives a long discourse. He talks about many shall be offended. You've been offended lately? People are offended everywhere. I mean, road rage is rampant because people are offended driving their car. Minding their own business. Get offended. Matter of fact, in this community, a well-known talk show host road rage pulled out a hatchet and then he got shot, didn't he? So y'all know. <laughs> so what are we going to do? What are we going to do with these times that we're living in? We just keep doing the same thing, expecting different results? That's brilliant, isn't it? Just keep doing the same thing, expecting different results results well last week Rita shared some thoughts and talked about dialing it down <clears throat> dial down anger fear frustrations your opinion well I know your opinion matters everybody's opinion matters I'll fight for your opinion but sometimes just because it goes across your brain don't mean it ought to come out your mouth everything you think should not necessarily be said. Some people, if they think it, they say it. And they get their mouth in gear before they get their mind in gear. 
Know anybody like that? And then there's always somebody that wants to give you a piece of their mind. But before you give a piece of your mind, you better be sure you've got some to spare. I need all, I need all the help I can get. But we talked about dialing it down. And there are some things that we as Christians in the body of Christ, we need to dial those things down. Because the stats say that there's really no difference between people in the church and people in the world. That's a tragedy. That's a tragedy. If we're not different, why aren't we serving God? What's the point? We are supposed to be a lighthouse. We are supposed to be different. We're supposed to love folks. As a matter of fact, we're supposed to love everybody. Makes me love everybody, the song says. So if we're supposed to love everybody, we're supposed to act different, we're supposed to be different, then why aren't we? When you get delivered out of sin, don't go back in sin. So we dial down the anger, the fear, the frustration, the opinions, the offense, the control, the doubt, all these things that, that we had before we came to know Christ, don't go back to those. Don't turn back to those. Don't go back into that lifestyle. I understand that sometimes it is a process to get out. He does something just that fast. But sometimes it takes us a while to turn loose. But once we come out, we don't need to go back. And so if we talked about dialing it down last week, there's some things that we need to ramp up this week as Christians. There's some things that we as the body of Christ should do. We should be leading the way. Touch somebody and say, lead. We should be leading the way. We should be living on a higher level. Not saying we're better than anybody, but when we get redeemed, when we get saved, when we give our heart to the Lord, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. So we need to ramp some things up. There are some things to dial down, but there are also some things that we need to ramp up. Now I'm going to move pretty quick today because I've got a lot of, a lot of ground to cover. But I'm going to hit some highlights, and you may want to jot down some notes. But first of all, we need to ramp up integrity. You want folks to have integrity when they deal with you, don't you? Don't you want the people that are in your world to have integrity? You want your spouse to have integrity? You don't want them going out having an affair on you every other week. You want them to have integrity. You want your boss to have integrity. You want your employees to have integrity. You don't want them stealing from you. And we can talk a lot about integrity, but there, there is an integrity deficit in the world. Can I bring it home? There is an integrity deficit in the body of Christ. Oh, it got quiet right then. Yeah. Integrity is something that we as Christians should have it it should go along with being a Christian if you're a Christian you should have integrity there are things that we just don't do if we're Christians because we have integrity you expect somebody that's a Christian to tell you the truth not to lie not to steal from you not to gossip and lie on you why is it so quiet Man, y'all were shouting a minute ago. But we need to ramp up integrity. The scripture says in Psalm 41, Because of my integrity, Lord, you uphold me and set me in your presence forever. When we maintain integrity, we can be sure that God will keep his hand upon us and we will walk with him forever and ever. But we must maintain integrity in our lives. Let me translate. Do what is right. Just do right. Treat people right. You know the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. 
It didn't say do unto others as they did to you. Treat people right. Even if they don't treat you right, treat them right. Do what is right. Do what is expected, but do what is right. Do what is right at home, at work, in the community, wherever you are. Do what is right. Because of my integrity, Lord, you uphold me and set me in your presence forever. We need to ramp up integrity in the body of Christ. Somebody say amen. And then we need to ramp up covenant. Covenant doesn't seem to mean anything to a lot of people anymore. They just break covenant. Just walk away from covenant. We need to ramp up covenant. We need to have covenant with one another. I've told you many times, people are like elevators. Some take you up, some take you down. God brings people into your life to take you up. Covenant people. The enemy will bring people into your life to take you down. We must have discernment to know that when somebody comes into our life, did they come from the God, from the Lord? Did the Lord send them? Did God send them? Or did the enemy send them to destroy you, to take you down, to get you off the wrong, get you off the right path and on the wrong path? We need discernment. That's not one of my points today, but we need to ramp up discernment. We need to pray and ask God to give us discernment so we can know. But covenant is one of the things that we need to ramp up. There is a covenant deficit in the body of Christ. You've never had a Judas, evidently. Somebody that you were connected to, that you were in a covenant relationship with. And they just walk away. Just stroll off into another world. Lose their mind. Break covenant. Break relationship. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Am I talking to the right crowd today? We need to ramp up covenant. When you make a covenant to somebody, maintain the covenant. Because I've got news for you. When you make a covenant with somebody, you won't always like what they say and do. They won't always like what you say and do. There will be times when you will want to quit. There will be times that you will scratch your head. There'll be times you will shake your head. There'll be times you will have conflict with people that you are in covenant with. But you don't break covenant just because there's conflict. Just because there is a difference of opinion. We as the body of Christ need to ramp up covenant. We need to stand arm to arm and back to back with people of God. And we need to walk together in unity in covenant. We need each other. We have a saying around here, we are better together. And we are. If you think you can make it all by yourself, help yourself. After a while, you're going to need somebody. You're going to need somebody. I've got a pastor friend. A number of years ago, he was deer hunting. He fell out of the tree stand. Broke both his arms. Had both of them in a cast like this. When you go to the bathroom, you need somebody. See, y'all are all thinking it. I said it. What are you going to do? What is a brother to do? We need each other. We need one another. And it's easy to get upset and to break covenant. It's easy to walk away. Anybody can walk away. Anybody can quit. I'm preaching better than you're shouting. But we need to ramp up covenant in the body of Christ. The Lord, Psalm 25, it says, The Lord leads with unfailing love and His faithfulness all who keep His covenant and obey His demands. The Lord leads with unfailing love and faithfulness all who keep His covenant and obey His commands. First of all, we should be in a covenant with God. And then a covenant with one another. The longer you stay in covenant and walk through some things and walk through some storms and go through some challenges and go through some difficult times, the more committed you become to the covenant relationship. I had a guy come in my office a number of years ago. He said he wanted to come into covenant with me. And traditionally especially in Bible days, when a covenant was made, 
there would be an exchange of gifts. When somebody came to you and they said they wanted to be in in covenant with you, they would bring you something that cost them something. And they would give you something. And you, in return, were to give something back to them. Sometimes there would be a blood covenant where they would cut their hand and they would join their hands together. The blood would mix and it would be called a blood covenant. Well, this gentleman came in my office one day and he said he'd been praying. The Lord told him to come into covenant with me. I said, okay. So he came and he brought me some things that were precious to him. He brought me his Big Bertha Driver Golf Club. Now, if you knew him, you knew that was something that meant a lot to him. And so he brings me this golf club and he brought me a couple other things. Then he brought a coat and put it on me. And he said, the Lord told me to come into covenant with you. And I'm saying, okay. And then the Lord spoke to me. And I, I love eagles. If you've ever been in my office, you know that I love eagles. And we preached on eagles here. We've done a series. If you remember a few months back, we actually brought uh, the eagle challenger that flies at uh, many of the large sporting events. We brought him. He flew across this room and landed on this stage. I love eagles. And at that time, I had on the corner of my desk an eagle that I had had made when I was in Jerusalem a very famous sculptor had made that eagle and had given it to me and so anyway it was on my desk and the Lord spoke to me and said give him your eagle and I said no <laughs> no no Lord that's that's my eagle that, that eagle cost me something and that is my favorite eagle of all the eagles that I have that was my favorite it was mounted on flint stone out of the Jordan River and it was overlaid with silver and gold. It was a very special eagle that I had. Not only that, when I had met this sculpture in Jerusalem and I asked him if he could make me one, he said, sure. He said, when you come to the um, Sea of Galilee, come to my shop there in a few days, I'll have it for you. When I got there, I said, do you have my eagle? He said, I've got something better. And I thought, oh yeah, something better. He didn't make me an eagle. He said, I didn't have time to make it, but he said, I've got this one. And he pulled it out. He said, this is my artist's proof for all. He said, he said every year I'm commissioned to make things for a different one. He had made things for the Pope and for many presidents. And he said, this eagle is one that I was commissioned to give all the presidential candidates in 1996. And he said, it's my artist's proof. I'm going to let you have this one. So it was very special. It was one of only about 12 in the world. And so it's sitting on my desk. This guy's coming in, giving me his favorite golf club and this coat. And, he's, and the Lord says, give him your eagle. No, anything you can't give away is an idol. Oh, did I step on somebody's toe? Anything you can't give away, if you're holding on to it, it's just stuff. When I came into this world, I didn't have anything. And when I leave this world, the only thing that I can take with me is the family and friends that I have led to the Lord, and they'll meet me on the other side. That's all. And the Lord says, give him that, give him, I started to say, give him that idol. Give him that, give him that eagle. And I said, no, no, I can't give that eagle. And the Lord told me again, give him that eagle. And so I finally picked it up and I started crying and travailing. No, not really. But, but I said, this, this means something to me. And so I gave it to him and I told him the story of where it came from. And he walked out with my eagle. But he left there and left me his golf club that was special to him that he had paid several hundred dollars for and if things had continued from there and the covenant had grown it would really mean something it was an act that's all it was his lifestyle didn't change his attitude toward me didn't change and there really never was a covenant. He lost a golf club, and I lost an eagle. But I was obedient. 
I know the Lord spoke to me. It was a test. But covenant should ensue. Covenant should continue. Covenant should grow. Our covenant with the Lord ought to get deeper and deeper. The old song, it gets sweeter as the days go by. It should get better day by day by day. In our covenant relationships with one another, it should get better day by day by day. Will storms come? Yes. Will challenges come to the relationship, to the covenant? Yes. Will there be battles? Will there be opportunities to walk away? Yes. A thousand times. But when you are in covenant with somebody and you are in covenant with God, no matter what happens, no matter what comes, no matter what your opinion, no matter what kind of storms, you will stay in the covenant relationship because you are in a covenant and a covenant should not be broken. It's stronger than a contract. It's not a piece of paper. It is something that you say and you make with your heart. We as the Christian in the body of Christ should ramp up covenant. We need to ramp up prayer. Man, we can call a fellowship meeting where there's going to be food and 150 people show up, 200 people, 300 people show up. People will come to eat free food. Call a prayer meeting and eight people show up the first week. Then the next week there's five. Then the next week there's three. I started a pastor's community prayer when we came back to Chattanooga. The Lord spoke to me. And it, he was very clear. He said, he said, find the place that's neutral ground. Because, you know, pastors are territorial. How many knew that? Pastors are territorial. And so the Lord spoke to me and he said, find a neutral place. And I really felt like he spoke to me to find a place downtown, a, a high building where we could look over the city and pray. And most pastors take Monday off. Now, I don't. I take Friday off. Sunday's the first day of the week, so Monday we hit the ground running. Sunday through Thursday, and then we take Friday off. Sometimes we have things we have to do on Friday or Saturday. But Monday is the day that most pastors take off. So... I wanted to see how many pastors wanted to pray. So we set our prayer meeting at 12 o'clock noon on Monday. And I felt like the Lord had spoken to me about starting this prayer. So we started this prayer. I found a building downtown. One of the bank buildings allowed us to have a place, a corner office. It was a big office. It was probably about the size of this stage. It was a huge room. And it was a corner room with windows on two sides looking over the city. And so I put the word out, and we started having prayer meeting. The first week, we probably had 50 men, and it grew. We got where we were having 75, 80 men every week. Sometimes we'd have over 100 pastors from this region, and we would come together, and we'd pray. And we prayed. I would facilitate the prayer. Sometimes I would encourage two or three others to help me facilitate the prayer, and we had we had. Baptists and Methodists and Presbyterian and Catholic and Pentecostals. We had black and we had white. We had every, every mix in this community. It was an awesome thing. And so we prayed every Monday for this city, for this community. And we did this for months. Probably six or seven months went by, maybe eight months. And then they came to us and told us we were praying too loud. Well, some didn't. Some of the people in there that were praying, they, they came from very liturgical, stayed, quiet traditions. And we would let them pray too. They would lead in prayer. So it wasn't always loud. But the powers to be decided we were praying too loud. And it was from 12 to 1. So most everybody that would have heard us should have been doing what during that time? It's their lunch hour. That's why we chose 12 o'clock, so we wouldn't disturb anybody during the work hour or the lunch hour. And so we prayed. And finally, after they told us we were praying too loud, they finally said, you're going to have to find somebody somewhere else to go. It's too loud. We, we can't take this. So we looked, and we looked for weeks, and we didn't really find anywhere. And 
Finally, some of them said, well, Pastor, could we come to your church? You're centrally located. You're right in the center of the, cha- uh, the county. It's easy access right there on the airport exit. Can we come to your church? I said, no, because you won't come. I'm glad for you to come, but if we do that, and we had all these pastors here, we were discussing it one day because they told us you've got to get out. And I said, I would be glad to open our church, but I know pastors are territorial, and some of you won't come. But we couldn't find anywhere else, so I said, okay, we'll, we'll come here. The first week, we had about 30. We went from having 70 and 80 on a consistent basis to having about 30. And we did pray for several years. We probably prayed for five or six, maybe seven years, every Monday, 12 o'clock, 12 to 1. And we, we had about 30, then it got down to about 28, 25, 23, 18. But we kept on praying until it got down to about two. And I thought, I can pray at home. I don't have to open it up for pastoral prayer for 1,200 pastors in the county and me and one more show up. We need to ramp up prayer. He said, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. It is time for the people of God to pray. It is our communication with God. It is the only way we have of talking to him. Now, he can speak to us through his word when we read the word. I guess you could write him a letter. But the primary way that we have of talking to God is when we pray. And it's an amazing opportunity. It's an amazing gift that God has given to us where we can go into an empty place, a quiet place, and we can seemingly just speak words into the atmosphere, but the God of the universe hears us. What an awesome gift. There are other people that you would like to talk to that you can't get to. There are political figures that you would like to, like to get in front of. There are economic figures. There are bankers you'd like to get to and say, I need to borrow some money. There, there are people you'd like to communicate with. There are some sports people that some of you would like to con- connect with and get their autograph and let them put their hand on you and help you and teach you and mentor you to be better in the sport that you're in. There are, there are some wealthy people that you'd like to connect with. There are some folks in Hollywood that you would like to connect with, some of you. And you can't get to them. But you can talk to God anytime. And we don't. Doesn't make sense, does it? We need to ramp up prayer because if we don't ramp up prayer, we short circuit our connection with Him when we don't pray. We break the connection. Now you get upset when you try to go online and you can't get online. What's wrong with this internet? What's wrong with my phone? What's wrong with my iPad or my computer? I can't get on the net. It's a net, all right. It will wrap itself around you and get you all tangled up. But if we don't pray, we short-circuit our connection with Him. Proverbs 15 says, The Lord is far away from the wicked, But he always hears the prayers of those who do what is right. You can be assured, if you do what's right, God listens to your prayer. He hears your prayer. In Mark chapter 11, 24, so I tell you to ask for what you want in prayer. And if you believe that you have received those things, then they will be yours. You have what you say. There is power in your sanctified word. There is power in your sanctified prayer. Something happens when you declare a thing in the spirit realm. Something happens when you talk to the God of the universe. When you listen to him and you talk to him and you commune with him in a covenant relationship and you maintain integrity and when you pray, something happens. God shows up. And if we don't pray, who will? I mean, if we as Christians don't pray, who's going to pray? Heathen aren't going to pray. They're not calling on God. They use his name in vain. 
If they say his name, it's followed with a swear word. Come on, somebody. So we need to ramp up prayer. Another way to do that is to have faith. We need to ramp up faith. Faith is important. But now a lot of people, they only have faith in their faith. They don't have faith in God. They have faith in their faith. They're proud of their faith. Now, faith comes to us three ways. You know how faith comes. Number one, the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. It also says, the Bible also says that when you were born, God dealt to you a measure of faith. So when you came into this world, God put some faith in you. A measure, the Bible says. How much is a measure? I don't know, but you don't need a lot. Faith the size of a mustard seed, the smallest seed, can move mountains. So you have a measure of faith. I'd be surprised if you didn't have at least mustard seed faith. And if you have mustard seed faith, you have enough faith to move mountains. To say to the mountain, get out of my way and be cast into the sea and the mountain has to move. And there are some mountains that get in our way sometimes. There are some mountains, some obstacles, some financial mountains, some relationship mountains, some physical mountains. There are all kinds of mountains that get in front of us and try to stop us and hinder us and keep us from going forward. Speak to it, the Bible says. Speak to the mountain and say, move. Get out of my way. And if you will ramp up faith in your life, it'll get easier. You have to ramp it up. Hebrews chapter 11 is the faith chapter. I love this chapter. It's a powerful chapter about faith. And I'm just going to give you some highlights here from the first six verses. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. I like to say it like this, now faith. What kind of faith? Now faith. Not yesterday's faith. Not your mama's faith or your daddy's faith or your granny's faith. But now faith. Faith that you apply For the moment, right now, the moment that you are in, now faith, it is the substance, the tangible, the thing that you can touch. It is the substance of what you are hoping for. It is the evidence of things that you cannot see. When you go into a courtroom, the attorney will say, this is exhibit A, it is evidence. This is exhibit B or C. This is evidence for the case. And the Bible says that faith is the evidence of things that you can't see. Does that make sense? It's the evidence. It's the exhibit of what you can't see. And most of us say, well, if I can't see it, how can I believe it? That's the exact point. You have to say it. And you have to see it in faith. If you want it to manifest in your life. So he says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things that you can't see. Now watch this. He said, for by faith the elders obtained a good report. Which tells me the elders didn't always have a good report, Theo. Oh. See, we put folks up on a pedestal. And we think they can't fail. The truth is, they all started down here. All of us. And we've all sinned and come short of God's glory, the Bible says. Right? And for by faith, elders obtained a good report, which tells us they didn't always have a good report. Folks that you've got confidence in, that you believe in, that you trust in, that are a good example for you, they weren't always that. They weren't always all that. But by faith, things begin to change. By faith... There was a moving in their favor. By faith, there was a shifting in their direction because they had faith in God. And when you have faith in God and when you ramp up your faith, things will begin to move in your favor. They will begin to shift in your direction. Come on, somebody. I'm preaching better than you're shouting today. When you have faith, when you begin to ramp up the faith, something happens. God begins to work on your behalf. There will be some things that will move in your favor. There will be some things that will shift in your direction. And then he said, it's by faith we understand. Mm. Have you ever seen something, a situation, and you just just shook your head? Just said, I don't understand. (laughs) 
don't understand this. I can't understand this. But by faith, we understand. Specifically, he said, by faith you understand that the worlds were framed by the the word of God. If the worlds were framed by his word, if the foundation of the world was framed, if it was laid by his word, then it stands to reason that the rest of the things that came together were framed by his word. That life in death, the Bible says, is in the power of the tongue. I'm trying to teach you something here today. When you have faith and you ramp up your faith and you understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, and he told us in Ephesians 5.1, be therefore imitators of Christ. As children. How many have children, grandchildren? Do they do they imitate you? Do they put on your shoes? Do they put on your sunglasses? Do they put on your clothes? Do you hear them saying the things that you say? They are imitating you. And the word of God tells us, Ephesians 5 1, to imitate Christ. To imitate God, to do what he does, to say what he says, to act like he acts. Hmm. So what did he say? What did he do? How does he act? It's in the Bible. If you go to the first book in Genesis chapter 1, we see that God began to say things and then he would see it. He saw the light that he made and he said it was good. He saw the creation and he said, it is good. He saw man and he said, it is good. He said it and he saw it. He said it and he saw it. He said it and he saw it. He spoke it and it happened. He, it came out of his mouth and then it was there. It was manifesting. How do we imitate him? With what we say, with what we do, with, what, with how we act. If we will do those things, if we ramp up our faith, we will see a change in our life. And then he said in verse 6, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. You can't please God without faith. And I told you it comes three ways. What is the third way? The third way is to get around folks that have faith. Hang out with faith people. Hang, Hang out with folks that have faith in their life, that you see the manifestation of faith in their life, hang out with them, spend time with them, listen to what they say, watch what they do, follow them as they follow Christ. That's what Paul said. Follow me as I follow Christ. So when you hang out with people of faith, it will build your faith. When you hear the word of God, it will build your faith. And you were born with a measure of faith. He dealt you faith when you came onto this planet. So let faith manifest, ramp up faith in your life. There's some things we need to ramp it up. Touch somebody and say, ramp it up. Oh, come on, tell them like you mean it. Ramp it up. Here's a good one. Everybody say that word together. That's about four of you. Let's all try it together. One, two, three. Commitment. Commitment. That was about 12 of you. Let's see if we can get everybody. One more time. One, two, three. Commitment. Oh, did it hurt? Commitment. Nobody wants to make a commitment. We avoid making a commitment. We avoid signing anything. We don't like to say it. We don't, I don't want to promise. How many times have you heard someone say, well, I'm not going to promise. I'm not going to promise. Because you know why people say that? Because they know that when they promise, it's a covenant, and our word is supposed to be our bond, and if we say we'll do it, we're supposed to do it. So we just back off and say, I, I'm not going to promise. No, I'm not going to promise. In other words, I'm not going to make a commitment. Dr. A used to just say like this, I'm just flat not going to do it. If he ever said that, you knew. He was, his feet were in concrete. I'm just flat not going to do it. But commitment is something that God expects of us. We should make a commitment, first of all, to serve Him. 
I'm not going to promise. I'm going to try, God. I'm going to try. I'm going to try to pray. I'm going to try to have integrity. I'm going to try to have faith. No, you don't try. You have it. You make a commitment to do something, and you do it. It is a commitment. And let me just go one step further. Commitment and, you're going to love this word, accountability are life partners. They are married. You cannot have commitment without accountability. You cannot have accountability without commitment. The two go hand in hand. The two are life partners. Commitment and accountability. Hmm. Y'all are quiet today. That's okay. Psalm 37 says, commit some of the things you do. Oh, did I miss that? Commit a few things. Commit those things that are comfortable to the Lord. If it's comfortable, if it's easy, if you feel good about it. No, he said commit everything you do to the Lord. Really? Everything? Everything? Uh Uh-huh. Commit everything you do to the Lord. Trust him. And watch this. He will help you. The indication is that if we don't commit everything we do to him and trust him, he's not going to help us. And I know most of you, you want him to help you. We want the Lord to help us. We depend on the Lord to help us. So if he's going to help us, we have to commit everything we do to the Lord and we have to trust him. Then he will help us day by day by day. Commitment. Accountability. Go hand in hand. Somebody say ramp it up. And then he wants us to ramp up our witness. I tell it like this. Everybody has a story. You need to tell your story. See, this doesn't mean that you have to go stand on the corner with a megaphone and a Bible under your arm and preach to everybody they're all going to hell. That's not getting a lot of folks saved in my opinion. Maybe some that are really struggling, yeah. But most of the time when I see somebody dressed up in a suit today on the corner with a Bible and a megaphone screaming, you're going to hell! I want to say, God, you're so out of touch. You're out of touch. People may be going to hell, but that's not going to reach me. But if I sit down with you at Starbucks, if I sit down with you, Gaber, and you tell me your story. You know, Gaber, he used to jump out of perfectly good airplanes. Paratrooper, right? In the Egyptian army. Raised as a Muslim. But here he is on the front row serving God, serving Jesus. <laughs> Baptized a few days ago. Do you know how powerful that is? Gaber, do you know how powerful that is? What, what a testimony. Y'all ain't saying nothing. What a testimony. What a powerful story. So if I'm struggling with my faith and I sit down over a cup of coffee and I say, tell me your story. And he tells me his story. It's a powerful story. It helps me. And I'm thinking, well, if, if Gabriel can serve God, I can serve God. If I sit down with Keith and I say, Keith, tell me your story. He said, oh, you won't believe my story. I said, yeah, yeah, tell me your story. I said, what do you do? He said, oh, I I work down at Teen Challenge. I help people get out of addictions, off that lifestyle. Well, well, good, tell me your story. Well, I was homeless and on the street. How many years? Fourteen years. On the street, homeless. And see, we see homeless people and we want to throw them away. See, you came alive right there, didn't you? You never know what somebody can be until you reach out and help them and witness to them. Somebody had to witness to him. Somebody had to care for him. Somebody had to show Keith that they loved him. Somebody had to show him there's a better way. And now he's helping people get off the street. 
get off of drugs, get off of alcohol, break out of addiction. Because he has a story, and his story, his testimony is a witness. We need to ramp up our witness. We need to ramp up our story. All we, it's not hard. All you've got to do is tell somebody what God did for you. That's what witness is all about. Just tell somebody that's lost your story. Because here's what God does. God... He orders our steps. The Bible says the steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. So he orders our steps. He directs our steps. So here's what happens. He puts you in the path of people that need to hear your story. That's the way it works. He's not going to put you in the path of somebody that you're not going to relate to. He puts you in the path of somebody that will connect with you and connect with your story and connect with your background and connect with where you are and where you came out of and where you are going and that will touch their heart and when you tell them let me just tell you what God did for me let me just let me just tell you when I called on him he heard me he answered me let me tell you what God did for me and because they can connect with you you witness to them Scripture, please. Psalm 66. Come and listen. We're going to meet at Starbucks. We're going to meet at Panera Bread. We're going to meet at lunch. Or come over to my house. My wife's going to make some cake. We're going to have a piece of cheesecake. Come and listen. All you who fear God, and I will tell you my story, he said. I will tell you what he did for me. That's my story. Just come and listen. Come sit down and I will tell you what he did for me. Here's where I was. I was on the street homeless. I was hooked on drugs. But I cried out to him for help. Praising him as I spoke. If I had not confessed the sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. So there's some deep theology right there in that part of that verse. It's saying if you don't confess your sin, he's not listening. If you're not serving God, you can pray until you are blue in the face. But if you're not confessing your sin first and then connected to him in a relationship, he's not listening. Oh, they didn't like that one, Tony. No, that's, that's what it says. He hears the prayers of repentance. And when you repent, then he's all ears to help you. But let me just go on with this. This is witness. If I had not confessed the sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But God did listen. Why? Because I confessed the sin in my heart. Praise God who did not ignore my prayer or withdraw his unfailing love from me. I told my story. My story is this. God, I'm a sinner. I need your help. I'm broke. I'm lost. I'm busted. I'm disgusted. And I need your help. Please help me. I'm a sinner. Forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart. Change my life. And the Lord did listen and he changed me. Tell your story. Tell your story. The reason we talk about connecting in life groups here so much is because we want you to tell your story and we want you to hear somebody else's story because when the two stories collide in the spirit realm, the anointing that's on both of your stories will help both of you and you become stronger together. We are better together. Is this thing quit working? Then wrap up worship. Worship. It's a lifestyle. Worship's not an event. Some people think, oh, I'm going to church on Sunday, I'm going to worship. Yeah, and we do. But it's not an event. Worship is a lifestyle. Worship is who I am. I am a worshiper. My lifestyle is that of worship. This week, Reed and I have been so blessed. You sent us on a forced vacation. Thank you very much. We missed the comedians Thursday night, but that's okay. We got a few days to break away, to rest, 
to relax, to refresh, to worship, to recharge. And that's important. We all need that. And if we ramp up our worship every day, if we live a lifestyle of worship, it is amazing. Worship is actually the password. And see, a lot of people, they lose their password. I used to lose mine a lot, but now I keep them saved in a safe place on Rita's phone. <coughs> no, I have a few of them on my phone too, saved in a safe place. And then when I need the password, I just, I just go there and I look it up and there's the password. And, and the password to victory in your life is worship. It is. Let me show you. In Psalm 100, lift up a great shout of joy to the Lord. Hallelujah. As you serve him, be glad and worship him. Sing your way into his presence. You can pass through his open gates with the password of praise. The password of praise. Come Bring your thank offering to him and affectionately bless his beautiful name. He keeps his promises to every generation. Praise is your password. Praise is your secret weapon. Praise and worship is your key to having doors open in your life to relationships, to all the blessings that God has for you. Praise and worship is your key. Amen? And then we want to ramp up giving. If you do all these other things, giving just is a natural part. Because the Bible says it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. It is. If, if you understand that. But you know, poverty is a mindset. You know why a lot of people don't give? They're afraid to. They think there's not enough to give part of what they have. That's why most people don't give. And in 2010, the average person in a church gave a grand total of $1,000 a year in 2010. Nationwide, nationwide statistics. In 2010, the average church member gave $1,000 a year. Now, if they're paying tithes, that means they made $10,000 all year. And most of us live really great on $10,000, don't we? I mean, we, we drive new cars, we, we have our own house, you know, we go out of town, we go on vacation, we do all these things on $10,000 a year, less than $1,000 a month, give $1,000 to the kingdom of God, that's great. Truth is, the 1000 that they were given in 2010 did not represent 10% of everybody across the body of Christ, because only a small percentage were tithing. But it's changed since 2010. And I don't have 2018 stats yet, but in 2016, two years ago, it had dropped from $1,000 a year, not a month, a year. The average church person gave $1,000 in 2010 for the whole year. In 2016, the average church person gave $400 a year. So they're living even better on $4,000 a year. Isn't it great how good we can live on $4,000 a year? It's quiet now, Rita. You want to come and take it now? I've got it. I've got it in a good shape, good place. But people are not giving. And then we get many calls, people needing help. And we can't always help folks because everybody's not doing their part. Hello, y'all are quiet now. I'm just, I'm just giving you stat statistics where we are in the body of Christ. Only about 2% of people in churches even pay tithes and give offerings in the body of Christ across the country. 2 to 3%. Now, it's, it's better here, but it's, it's nowhere near. 50% or 40% or 30% is 
It's a small percentage. Yet, if you go eat lunch today, and you order whatever you want to eat, and feed your physical body, and you try to leave without paying, they're going to call the popo on you. You, you, don't, you might get by with it once or twice. You might scam a few. But where to get out, they'll recognize who you are. And you can't just keep going in restaurants and not paying. If you decide you need some clothes and you go over to the mall and you go through some of those shops and you pick up what you want and just lift it and just slip on out of there, they're going to catch you. Everything's on camera now. And if they don't have one mounted somewhere where you are, somebody's standing close by going, Do you see that? Look, look, look. I'm going to post this. Yet, we want the blessings of God without doing our part. We need to ramp up giving in the body of Christ. In Luke chapter 6, he says, give generously, and generous gifts will be given back to you. Now, that, that, just, just reading that far in the scripture seems like a powerful opportunity. You give generously. And generous gifts will be given back to you. But not just generous gifts given back. Not just equal. If you give a dollar, you get a dollar back. No, he says it's going to be given back to you. Shaken down to make room for more. Abundant gifts will pour out upon you with such an overflowing measure that it will run over the top. The measurement of generosity becomes the measurement of your return. The more you give, the more you get back. You have a need, sow a seed. Pay your tithe, give an offering. You have a need, give and watch God give it back to you. It's a principle. Galatians 6, 6, 7, and 8. God is not mocked, but whatever a man sows that, he will also reap. If you sow sparingly, you reap sparingly. If you sow to the flesh, you reap to the flesh. But if you give abundantly, you're going to be blessed abundantly. It works. Ramp up your giving and watch what God does in your life. The reason Reed and I have been blessed as we have for all these years is because we have been faithful to give and we have been blessed way beyond what we had because we learned the principle of sowing and reaping. Ramp it up. And then ramp up your growth. So many people in the body of Christ, their growth has been stunted. They're little. Their faith is little. Their integrity is little. Their covenant is little. Their commitment is little. Their giving is little. So their growth is little. God wants us to grow. It is natural for you to grow. When you are born and you're in the hospital room and you weigh seven pounds and four ounces, if you stay seven pounds and four ounces for 12 months, there's a problem. If you don't grow, something's wrong. We are supposed to grow. Growth is natural. Growth is what God designed us to do. Everything big starts with something small, but it grows. God wants us to grow, and we are to ramp up growth in the body of Christ. Our relationship should grow. Our faith should grow. Our prayer life should grow. Our integrity should grow. Our character should grow. Our giving should grow. All of these things should grow in the body of Christ. We should experience growth. Next slide, please. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5 through 9. Do all you can to add to your life these things. He said, add faith. Add faith. And then he said, add goodness to your faith. And then he said, add knowledge to your goodness. And then he said, add self-control to your patience. And then devotion to your patience. And then kindness to your devotion. And then he said, add love. And he said, if all these things are in you and growing, watch this. You will never, you will never fail to be useful to God. But those who don't grow in these, in these things or in these blessings are blind. They have forgotten that they were cleansed from their past sins. If you add these things in your life, you will grow. Growth is the natural process. Growth is what's supposed to happen in your life. And as you grow, you are blessed. And as you, blessed, as you are blessed, you will continue to grow. Somebody say amen. amen. So just to give you a recap... We should have integrity. We should ramp up covenant, commitment, prayer, faith, 
our witness, our story, our worship, our giving, and our growth. And if we do all of these things, growth is the natural process. But they all work hand in hand. You can't just have one. We ramp all of these things up. And as we ramp these things up, you become the man of God, the woman of God that God intends for you to be. So let's ramp it up. Start with me. Start with you. Start today. If we don't become what we're supposed to be, who will? If we as Christians don't do it, who will? If we don't lead, who will? If we don't grow, who will? If we don't give, who will? If we don't maintain integrity, who will? We are the example. We are the example. It's us. We're supposed to grow. We're supposed to be all that God wants us to be. Day by day by day. Amen? So let's ramp it up. Put your hand on your heart. And just pray this prayer. Just say, God, anoint me to ramp it up. In all of these areas of my life, forgive me of my sins. I'm a sinner, and I need your grace. I need your forgiveness today. So I repent, and I call on you to cleanse my life, to come into my heart fresh, and be the Lord of my life. When I stumble and fall, I will get up, but I depend on you to help me through my struggles, through my fears, through my doubts, and through all the challenges that come into my life. I'm trusting you to grow, to be all that you want me to be. From this day forward, I'm committed to you. I worship you, Lord. I give you praise. For all the blessings that you have given me. And I understand that my worship and my praise is the password to victory in my life. I'm nothing without you, Lord. So I'm trusting you. Heal my body. Heal my past. My hurts my brokenness anoint me to help somebody use me day by day anoint me to ramp up these things in my life in Jesus name amen amen and amen just lift your hand to him right now just lift your hand Open your mouth to him and praise him. Tell him how much you love him. Father, we thank you. We adore you. We honor you. In the name of Jesus, we trust you, God. We trust you. We praise you for who you are, for what you're doing. We give you all the praise. We give you all the thanks. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah.